So, uh, Nikki, thank you for being here and uh, for joining us uh, with this film. It was actually Nikki who suggested that we show this film when she was here in November for Tasha Hubbard's film. Uh, she said, hey, my friend's in a movie. Why don't you show that film? And I thought, well, maybe, but we have to see it first. And then we saw it and we loved it. So that is how the film came to our attention. We had not heard about it previously. So you have Nikki to thank for having the film here. Um, so yes, we've had two screenings. We've added a third at 4.15. You can tell your friends and family. And uh, Nick, I'll just turn it over to you. And uh, Melina hopefully will wander in the door at some point. Um, yeah, I'm, I, it's actually very auspicious that this has all worked out so well. Um, Melina has been uh, very sick this last year um, as a cumulative uh, impact of her commitment to this work. Um, so she hasn't been uh, doing any public appearances or anything uh, save for the one just that happened uh, a week and a bit ago for power to the people um, but I mean I was thinking so much during this screening um, both of her exposure to the chemicals that have been a reality for her um, home life in Little Buffalo uh, the Lubicon Cree Nation in northern Alberta which is adjacent to the tar sands as well as as an international advocate um, against the fossil fuel industry's poisoning of our collective uh, life source her exposure as you see in this film it was it was really difficult for me to see that um, what the impacts for her own body have had to, to endure in order for her to champion this work for our collective well-being. Um, so I just want to take a moment for people to really let that sink in. This is a young woman whose personal life, whose um, physical health, whose family life has been impacted on every level by this colonial system and who is still committed to fighting in this way. Um, it was difficult to convince her to be here. I'm, I'm sure that she will show up. Uh, but I think that even today, uh, we're waiting on a final announcement for the implications of um, the meetings that ended up lasting three days between the hereditary chiefs and um, Carolyn Bennett and Nathan Collin on behalf of the Canadian government, who apparently is now a petro state, because ultimately the final outcomes of those meetings was that um, the Canadian government doesn't have the power to enforce RCMP or CGL to actually uphold their commitments to UNDRIP um, or to Canadian citizens or to their own conventional rights under uh, the Dalgamuk uh, rulings of Indigenous sovereignty, land title, free prior and informed con consent. So our guest of honour is back. Thank you. You always keep me on my toes and I'll just <laughs> welcome you up. This mic doesn't work for the room, so we have to project, but it works for the, the camera. So welcome back, Melina. I cried a little bit before you. Hi. <laughs> How much did I miss? Not really just okay. 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 So we're just going to jump right into the Q&A. Okay. <laughs> Um, the first question, I mean, this is such a powerful project and I wanted to ask you, like, there's so many things that you must have had that you got to share with people while filming this. Like, it seemed like we were really following you on a journey. So the outcome of this, like, what did you take away as the biggest learning for yourself and for your own work from this project? Um, I can hold it. Um, I think for me it was just, I, I, I learned it as a younger age that um, Indigenous peoples like worldwide are experiencing the same thing we're experiencing. Even, even though in Canada we experience colonialism in certain ways that look different than they, may do, than they might in South America, that they're still kind of very similar. And then, so going down south, and I have um, throughout kind of my adulthood, I went to, after I finished my first degree, I actually lived in Brazil for a while and did organizing in some areas. So it was for me um, just like a reaffirmant of, reaffirmation, I guess, of um, just how much struggle there is for Indigenous peoples worldwide, but also how much um, solidarity there is and how much love there is in the same ways that we love the land, that we are literally sacrificing our bodies and our lives um, so all people can breathe and 
so climate change doesn't have become runaway um, the way that it actually has been. But yeah, so for me, it was just about kind of the commonalities of North and South, just like where you're from. Um, yeah, so the, uh, the auspicious part that for both for Melina and I is that we have been um, very close uh, and really supported each other's work for ever since we've known each other, but we've actually never gotten to co-present. It's always been one of us kind of in a supportive role or the other, so to be here with her is an incredible honor, especially with this film, um, which I wore my mom's uh, whip heel today, uh, which is from the Guatemala side of my territory, but I'm from the Chalatenango region of El Salvador, Papil and Maya, um, and so our prophecy is very similar. It talks about a, a serpent from the south and an eagle from the north, but it meant so much to be able to come and share this with you today because that's been a lot of our connection as well is that understanding that what is going on in in our territories might not be the exact same thing but it absolutely comes from the same source and it absolutely comes from a worldview that ultimately is a death view ultimately will not allow for um, any life form uh, save for mother earth herself to continue on breathing so with that in mind, the, the unity of this story is so powerful and so empowering, and a lot of that's been facilitated through things like the, the UN Climate Talks and UNDRIP, but I'm especially given everything that's happening right now under, you know, John Horgan, and you know, while he's uttering the breath that we're going to continue commitments to UNDRIP, and while Articles 3, 4, 10 are actively being breached um, as he's making those commitments and in the, fr in the throne speech and in his statements, I want to ask you, like, how effective do you think that that model, the UN model or UNDRIP or any kinds of those human rights commitments that governments are actively committing to and then turning around and facilitating the way for petrochemical companies to come in and continue to make these kinds of impacts in indigenous communities. What's your thought on that? Um, I think it's hard because I've been going to different UN meetings since I was, you know, early 20s and uh, for about 15, almost 20 years. And so it's it felt like it's a nice kind of trying to it's it's like something in the horizon that you can never reach. That's what I find the UN is for me. So <laughs> the UNFCCC, it's like all of these things where we make these commitments to indigenous peoples or we make these commitments to climate reductions in our GHG emissions and yet then we see every country in the world reneging on those commitments. And so for me, the UN has no enforcement. And so it's frustrating for me when we spend a lot of time and energy on the UN because I feel like the way in which these um, international laws are they're just not enforceable and so for me it's it's great to have those out and outlined and drafted and I'm not saying that all the work that's been done is you know it's it's a very it's a lot of work I know elders that have spent 20 years on the UN drip and that's that's like a life commitment and so I'm not saying that that's not important because it's good to have those outlines of of what is kind of aspirational but I would say unfortunately because um, it's not enforceable it makes it very frustrating when you're trying to uphold UNDRIP or um, free pride informed consent, but yet we see governments continuously not honoring those, even though it took years. Um, many countries signed on to the UNDRIP, and then you know Canada, US, New Zealand, and Australia were the like four countries, the Commonwealth countries that didn't sign on for a number of years, and then they finally did. But yet, here we see with Soatin and violation of human rights and violation of economic rights um, across her island. So I think it's just, it's frustrating. So it, it's, it's good to have them, but they're also it's also like we can't kind of put all our eggs in one basket. And that's why I actually stopped going to the UNFCCC. I went to the UNFCCC um, a decade ago and it was great, you know, run around for two weeks and make a lot of noise. And it's important for people to show up in those spaces to uphold human rights, uphold ind indigenous rights, uphold the rights of nature. But at the same time, I feel like we need to be home in our own communities doing implementation of solar projects, implementations of actually ways, climate solutions that we can actually reduce our greenhouse gas emissions within communities and not just going internationally and just kind of burning more GHG yeah. emissions. So that's kind of how I feel about it personally. 
One of the things I love about this prophecy is that it really speaks to everyone. So it's a prophecy that talks about the uniting of Indigenous people from the North and South, but that, that it will be the pathway forward that applies to everyone and leads life forward for all people, regardless of their identities or their cultural background. Um, in our prophecy, it, it actually says specifically that the, although this is a very trying time, um, every spirit who came to be alive during this time came with specific purpose and specific gifts. And I love that because I really like even seeing Kalia um, sing in that film or the art that's in Seriaku, like whatever your gifts are, we are absolutely in a very critical time and they're needed. They don't necessarily have to be conventional, but they're needed and you're here for that reason. Um, I know that a lot of people come to you all the time and kind of ask like, what can I do? You know, and, and I feel like that's really unfair to ask the people who are the busiest and exuding the most energy to try and actually like carry this forward at every level they can. So I'm going to save you a bit of breath and just ask you right now, since we have a nice group in the room, if you were going to give that advice for people who maybe don't necessarily have a singular uh, sense of what they can do. Um, how would you advise in this particular time as Canadian citizens or uh, visitors, people who live in a beautiful community, who have access to nature, what's something that they might be able to do um, to, to help assist these, these people around the world who are doing such hard work? Um, I think for me, I used to uh, be more concerned about kind of like the big picture, and I am concerned about the big picture, but I think when you see frontline individuals putting themselves on the front line, you know, for decades, or um, for me, it's been almost 20 years, and I think for me, as I've noticed my body starting to break down because it actually can't hold the stress or the emotional labor or the trauma or all of the different things, I think what you could actually do, and is like one I used to tell people, of course, learn the history of where you're from, understand the people in the lands that you walk on, what ancestors are there with you, um, acknowledging those ancestors and acknowledging the history and the people um, as settler people. I say that's like number one for sure. But I would say like then if you have relationships with Indigenous peoples, how, and if they're doing frontline work, how can you just support them as like a friend, as somebody that's like a relation? Um, and so for me, that's like the biggest thing I find um, when I got bedridden and I got really sick, it was actually people, the way that people would show up with like meals or with like how can we do body work? How can we actually support people that are like actually continuing to put burden on their bodies um, and don't have access to places like Salt Spring that don't live in Salt Spring that are on the front lines that are, you know, the families are constantly getting cancer. I think there's ways in, we, in which we can actually support individual activists. And so if you have relationships with those people, figure out how to support them in ways that are actually very, um, very tangible if possible, because I feel like, um, what we see in this kind of capitalistic culture is like just expecting young people to con continue to do the work and then just like work. What I did was like work just 24 seven for like, for I don't know, since I was a teenager. And then just like, oh, now that person's burnt out and let's just throw away, you know, this like throwaway culture. And it's just like, that's actually not okay. And so how do we actually um, support people? Um, and we talk about the sacred hoop and we talk about reciprocity with Mother Earth and and like, how does that include with each other? How do we actually include each other in, in that work as well? And in kind of being heart centered more as opposed to like, just for me, a lot of times it was like more psychological and, you know, but now I'm like, actually, how do we support one another and uplift one another in ways that kind of create the longevity of this movement and this work? So what I'm hearing you say is that the community of Salt Spring should come together and create a healing center for frontline activists. Is that, was that like just to summarize? Yeah, I think that'd be a good place to start. Um, and just to say, when Melina was really sick, that was one, one thing that we found incredibly hard to find, like anywhere on earth to go and just heal and be well. That wasn't either very much kind of an appropriative and, and really uh, financially inaccessible like meditation program or, you know, like an eco farm that required you to be able bodied. So um, to, just to put a plug in here that like there are so many young women and two spirit people. In fact, right now, all of them are sleeping on the legislature steps. Um, on the ones on Vancouver Island at least, um, who are putting their bodies 100% at risk of violence, under attack, um, ex being the most exposed to environmental toxicity, um, who do need healing and support. So I, I feel like, especially in this community, th there's a lot of healers, and that's something that's deeply needed. Um, going back to prophecy, 
Your name is Miowapan, and it means morning sunrise. Um, I just want to ask you a little bit about Sacred Earth Solar and how you've fulfilled your own prophecy and continue to do that with your work in Power to the People. So my dad, actually, when I was born, my dad named me Miowapan, which means like sunrise or beautiful morning. And it's funny because I actually started implementing solar projects for my master's degree. And so it was a part of the or, um, organization I started called Sacred Earth Solar, which implements renewable energy projects in indigenous communities, especially ones that are on the front line. Um, so you can go to sacredearth.solar and you can see just different videos of projects going up in indigenous communities. Um, but also with that, yeah, it was, it's about, you know, a new, new dawn, a new era of renewable energy technology that can be utilized. It, that's more in connection with indigenous ways of being and knowing and ways of not extractive, more rejuvenative types of energy. And so I actually just recently finished filming um, a TV show called Power to the People, which actually goes across um, Canada and it's in 26 locations across the country. We went to different types of projects, renewable energy from um, geo exchange to district energy to large scale wind or solar to small scale solar. Um, so micro hydro, not, not mega hydro. Um, so there's a lot of technologies that are being utilized in indigenous communities, hundreds and hundreds. Actually, we couldn't even cover the whole gamut, but so if you have, if you want to watch, it's, they're, they're really short episodes, they're 22 minutes long, so just like a half an hour, but p tune into APTN, um, and you can, if you have cable, you can watch it for free. Um, it's called Power to the People, and so yeah, that's the type of, for me, that's the type of, um, media that I want to see in the world, positive media, uplifting media, media that actually um, fills people's hearts up, not gives people terror and fear of what the future is, but how they can actually play a part of the future and be a part of the future um, and empower their own communities. And so for me, that's kind of, yeah, it comes from, I think it definitely comes from that name, like you were saying earlier. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to Melina. Thank you.